Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 20th of July 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows, and the game in the background as it is this week is Wolfenstein 2009, which is taking on something of an Indiana Jones feel right now, which is one of the things I love about this game, honestly. It's very fun indeed. First one comes in from Jacob. Let's keep this short and simple, he says. What are your thoughts on backdooring in League of Legends and Heroes of New Earth, and why do you think it's so frowned upon by a big part of the community? My thoughts on backdooring are that backdooring is a completely legitimate tactic, and if you get caught out by it, then you've probably done something wrong. There is a reason why, of the bans that our fixed team usually does, Twisted Fate is a very very common ban. Now, those of you who don't play League of Legends, maybe you play Horn, or maybe you've just played Dota or whatever, here's what Twisted Fate can do. Twisted Fate's ulti is a global teleport that also reveals every player on the map. So you know exactly where everyone is, and you can teleport in. As such, he's very much a ganker character. Admittedly, he is very, very fragile. He's quite difficult to play as well. Has a pretty high skill ceiling. But that also means that he can backdoor and do big damage. What is backdooring, for those of you who might not know? Well, backdooring in League of Legends, Heroes of New Earth, and Dota involves bypassing the enemy team entirely in order to usually solo attack a tower, or in the case of League of Legends, an inhibitor, or even perhaps the Nexus. Now, I don't know what the equivalent is in Heroes of New New Earth, I can't quite remember, but whatever the buildings are that cause big stompy dudes to come out if they get killed. As I recall correctly, you had to kill the entire base except for the Nexus, the World Tree, or the Altar, or whatever the hell to cause those spawns in those games. But in League of Legends, there are three inhibitors, one for each lane. If an inhibitor is destroyed for several minutes, it will spawn super creeps. The inhibitor will respawn after some time, though, so it is possible to hold it. Whatever the case, backdooring involves bypassing those fights. The thing is, it actually puts your team at a disadvantage if you do it, so it really is a very risky strategy that can be used to great effect. It can win you games, but it can also lose you them. I was actually playing a game earlier where I'm pretty sure that the game was lost because of Warwick decided to go and backdoor and left his team in a situation where we could push into their base, tower dive them, and destroy them. And then we took out a couple of inhibitors, pushed the Nexus Towers, and won the game. So backdooring works sometimes, and not so much other times and it is possible to deal with if you have good ward placement if you have good awareness of where people are and you know the state of your lanes you should be able to respond to backdooring you should know that it's going to be happening this is the kind of thing that, as far as I'm concerned, comes up an awful lot because some people just simply do not understand what the competitive mindset is. Now, if you believe that you can actually do the damage and you believe it would be of benefit to your team to do a backdoor, you should do it. And there was a great article by Serlin over at Serlin.net, which I would recommend you read pretty much his entire website. He's got some amazing, and I do mean absolutely stellar write-ups on certain things, including the idea of the competitive mindset it. And what he says is that those who are scrubs, yeah, and he used this term as a player that is not of the competitive mindset, a scrub, will impose limitations on themselves by claiming that things are overpowered or imbalanced or cheap or not honorable. And in reality, in a competitive game, those aspects of the game are completely irrelevant. I'll tell you, I used to have problems with Dota because when I first started playing it, I had the same issues. I felt that, like, say, ganking in lanes was dishonorable. Leaving your lane and just roaming around ganking people, I felt that was a dishonorable, five on one. It's a, and then I realized, oh yeah, this is actually the way the game is supposed to be played. And the way that you avoid that from happening is by having map awareness and knowing that it's coming and then turning it around on your opponent. Yes, you should be getting ganks whenever you can. If you get in a situation where three guys can jump a guy and you have no risk to yourselves whatsoever, then for God's sake, do it. Get the kill. It's the money, the experience and so forth. Why is ganking okay? And and yet backdooring isn't. I think backdooring is probably hated simply because a lot of people have at one point or another lost to it and they felt that they were cheated out of a win. In reality, no, they were not cheated out of a win. Something happened within the bounds of the game that was entirely fair and reasonable and you fell for it. GG, you lost because of your own stupidity. That is your problem. And for God's sake, I would suggest that you ban Twisted Fate if you're really scared of backdooring happening in ranked ladder games. 
This one comes in from Luke that says, I've noticed an increasing trend of MMOs going free to play, or at least in Warhammer Online's case, free to buy. All you have to do is pay a subscription. Is this, in your opinion, the way forward, or do you feel that it's just a final plea to get more subscribers for the game? Also, does having a free to play or free to buy MMO have any downsides? For instance, do you think customer service or content will suffer from this? Also, do you feel that MMOs these days are losing their sense of challenge? For example, the first MMO I played was Dark Age of Camelot. Now, I don't know if it's simply gotten better, but I feel that game was a lot more challenging than the newer MMOs. Hell, even WoW, when it first came out, was what I class as a challenge compared to nowadays. If so, why do developers have this constant need to satisfy everybody in a way that makes it possible for bad players to essentially come across as, dare I say, good? Well, that's a couple of questions, so let's talk about the free-to-play model. The reason the free-to-play model exists is because of World of Warcraft. It's as simple as that. And the reason that I'm saying that, and not saying, oh, because it was ported over from Korea and Taiwan and places like that, which is true, it was, the reason it exists in Western games is because of World of Warcraft. Why? Because most people are not willing to have more than one subscription to an MMO. And you know what that subscription's gonna be? It's gonna be WOW! I remember interviewing Max Schaefer of Runic Games, the guys behind Torchlight, quite some time ago, and he was talking about the Torchlight MMO and the ideas for the Torchlight MMO, and he said, everyone's got a WoW account. You have to assume that everybody has a WoW account, and you have to build your business model around that idea. So until WoW dies out, yes, most people will not be paying for more than one subscription. That's just They just don't do it. It adds up. It really can add up. And if you have two subs, that's $30 a month. That's quite a lot of money when you think about it. You can add all that up and you can figure out exactly how much that's going to be. And you're spending $660 a year on MMO games. So you found that some games went down the free-to-play model, and some of them did really well. DDO, for instance, is thriving. I believe at last count it has around 3 million players, and I believe a third of those are actually subscribing to the game. So, you know, that's a really, really strong player base. And also, in terms of revenue generated, Turbine reported that their profits just skyrocketed after it went free-to-play, because people will accept the free-to-play model if it is done in a proper way. There was a fantastic video on the subject of this. Of course it's fantastic, it's by extra credits, why wouldn't it be? I'll put a link in the description below this video, I'd recommend you watch it. It's on the subject of microtransactions and how to make them reasonable and fair. And if you apply all the standards that the creator of extra credits stated needed to be there in order for a successful free-to-play model, you will find that DDO pretty much gets them all. That's how good a free-to-play model DDO actually has. And Lord of the Rings Online has a similar model now. Turbine is doing a fantastic job of being the pioneers of the Western free-to-play model that's actually fair, balanced, and reasonable for the community and the player base, as well as having decent games. That always helps. It makes sense for a lot more games to go along this route, particularly because people have been burned too much by MMOs in the past. I mean, the idea that you have to pay for the box is kind of silly now in this day and age. You pay $60 for a game. Yes, it'll come with a month's subscription, but big deal. After that, you're also paying then $15 a month. That's a lot of investment. And you might decide that you just it's just not for you. And I've been burned by MMOs in the past. Hell, you just mentioned one, Warhammer Online. I was burned by that game. Why? Because in the first month or two of its release, the combat was awful. And you want to know why it was awful? Because the servers lagged too much. It was horrendous. By the time they finally got that fixed up, I just didn't care about it anymore. I mean, the combat was never as good as I would have liked it. It just wasn't responsive enough. It didn't have the clout that I was looking for in an MMO title. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the combat in that game is worse than Guild Wars, and Guild Wars is a free game that came out before that and actually did a really good job of putting together some very nice combat as well as good pvp which is what war was looking to do and just didn't quite hit the mark with unfortunate but that's simply the case i would like to see more games follow with the ddo model because i think it's fair and reasonable i don't really fancy paying 60 dollars for a box on an mmo that may or may not flop within the first month it's not exactly great is it at least I know when I buy a game for $60, it's not suddenly going to disappear on me. And there are plenty of MMOs that have done just that or have just died out. And just remember, just remember, folks, that the MMO is driven by the people playing it. It's driven by its player base. And as a direct result of that, if you have the player base completely implode in on itself within the first month, well, that's a wasted box you have there. Very unfortunate. I have a couple of wasted boxes, and I certainly don't want to buy any more of them. 
As regards to the challenge, I honestly feel that I've covered this several times in the mailbox before and in previous Azeroth dailies and beta content, so I really don't think I need to repeat it. I was more interested in talking about the free-to-play thing. This one comes in from Niall Pudding that says, I want to talk about the way some games are currently being developed, and if that is generally hindering the quality of those games, or perhaps future games. The lead designer at Frictional Games, those are the guys behind Amnesia, by the way, brought up a similar topic a couple of months ago on his blog. Basically, he said a huge proportion of games these days are being released early, way before their beta stages. A good example of this is Minecraft and how it was released even before the alpha stage. As awesome as it is getting a game early rather than later and having to wait a long time, I think this early release could damage the way a game could develop. For example, not just being told hundreds if not thousands of ideas every day that should be included in the game. I think this is because Notch has pretty much released an unfinished game. I'm not saying this way of developing games is necessarily bad because games that are released in its finished stage without any outside help also has its disadvantages as well. I hope you understand what I'm getting at in this message and I'm curious as to your opinions on the topic. Well, really we're talking about Minecraft here, aren't we? We're not talking about a huge number of games that are actually being released in alpha or beta format with people being asked to pay for them. But it's not the worst idea in the world. I mean, it's funny that Frictional Games should say that because they actually sold pre-orders at like a 50% discount because they were, they were running out of money. They had no money left. They couldn't finish their game. So they put out a bunch of pre-orders and said, buy our game before it's out and before that you know it's any good whatsoever, and we might finish it. Or maybe we won't. Maybe we'll run out of money and then collapse in on ourselves. Who knows? But when it comes to Minecraft, it's a fairly unique example of a game that has grown in a fairly major way since Alpha. But it's still also not a game yet. It lacks any sort of objective. It's funny, I saw a big post about the Artifacts mod, which is actually going to turn it into a game. It takes quite a lot of ideas from Terraria, which is smart, considering that a uh, good place to look for ideas when it comes to giving your game a little bit more focus, but still being sandboxy and buildy. But really, I mean, Minecraft has no point to it whatsoever. It's just a sandbox. Once you get to a certain point, I think you just get bored of it. I certainly did. I mean, I'm not a big fan of building huge structures and things like that. It's cool to create, but I was hoping for the ability to build a castle and then defend it with friends against legions of attackers, and it just doesn't happen. You've got to mod the game in order for anything like that to happen. The combat is absolutely abysmal, and the monsters cease to be a threat after a while, with the exception of the occasional creeper ruining your day. But... Terraria did a better job of that, and I was pretty happy with the fact that they went in there with the idea that, yes, we have to give our game just a little bit of direction. And to be fair, Terraria is less of a building game than it is of a Metroidvania exploration combat game, which is also cool. Minecraft, it doesn't have to be the same as that. It's a different thing. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here. I don't see a lot of games doing that, but I don't think it's a bad thing that they do. Indie funding can be difficult. I do believe that, yes, the game can be influenced in a negative way, but honestly, I think that Notch is doing a pretty good job of filtering out the good ideas from the bad and letting the modding community deal with things that people want. I mean, did anyone really ask for pistons? I mean, really, Notch seems to put in what he believes is a cool idea. And note blocks? Did anyone ask for that? Redstone circuitry to create all this crazy stuff. This is not what the player base, as far as I can tell, is asking for. They're asking for some much more obvious things, and I think that perhaps they will be implemented eventually, but Notch sort of seems to put things in on whimsy because he has this idea of what he wants the game to become, and that's fine, as far as I'm concerned. I think with a game like Minecraft, because of the size of the modding community, it doesn't really matter what he puts in as long as he doesn't break the damn thing, and as long as he puts in the support for people to create with it. I have to say, I am fairly surprised to see that more games are not going down this route. I know Space Pirates and Zombies did that because they needed it. They, they funded it. It's just two guys making Space Pirates and Zombies. You've got to understand this. They self-funded the game, so they needed to get some sales. They had to because they needed to live and eat. That's kind of important. So they released the beta and you get a discount of it, but to be fair, the beta pretty much works. I mean, it's almost a complete game. There's a lot more coming out in terms of those upgrades as well. And I know that once it's complete, they're releasing it on Steam too, which is great. It's absolutely fantastic. 
I am surprised not to see more go down this route. I do think there is the potential to listen to stupid ideas because communities can get some very weird things going on. And more often than not, you'll find a community springs up around a beta game or an alpha game very quickly and the, the power players start to emerge and they try and influence the direction of the game because it's something they would like when in reality it might not be good for the game in general. It can be harmful, but I'm not seeing any real evidence that it harmed Minecraft thus far. And I think that... I would like to see a few more indies doing that because it is kind of cool for the community to sort of get involved a little bit in the development of a game. And I'd certainly rather they do that than not release the game at all because they can't afford to do it. And you never know what kind of cracks and problems can be found out and developed upon or indeed reimagined by going through a public paid alpha phase where people are actually directly involved in the development process. It's always great to have a few thousand pairs of hands shaking down your machinery to see if any bolts or nuts fall off it. Okay, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching the mailbox, and I will see you next time.